people here today. Um, I, I've moved on. One of the things that I have been doing is trying to track scholarly communication um, as it uh, has changed because of the arrival of the internet. And so I have gone through several things. Uh, there was a whole thing about first of uh, journals coming on in electronic format and replacing print. There was the out of print book market. Uh, we're suddenly at ebooks again. And the thing that I really think that's on the horizon now and that people haven't thought enough about is the importance of self published materials. And I will give some evidence of that importance in a few minutes. I'm not going to read this. This is just kind of a summary of the topics that I'm going to present. Uh, I'll work my way through that list. I think I need to give my credentials. It, as I said, it's my current research interest. And much of this is coming from a special segment I did in a publication called Against the Grain, which is one of the best publications in the library world on current things in collection development. I had six or seven people explain their experiences, plus I've asked around and I've talked to people. I'm, I'm not sure how much solid scholarly evidence is out there yet on self-publishing. I'm not even quite sure how to get at it. Uh, I haven't self-published yet. Uh, do we have any people here in the room who have self-published? I have. Okay. But I haven't released it to public domain. Okay. All right. Maybe you can chime in with some of your experiences at the right time. The importance of self-publishing. I actually started my interest in this driving out of the parking structure one evening, listening to NPR. And there was a woman on NPR who was basically telling self-publishers how to market their materials. And she gave the statistic that of the last year of the million books published, 750,000 were self-published. Now, I haven't really been able to verify that one. I think she's exaggerating, but I'm not sure that she's exaggerating a whole lot because I just read within the last week uh, a, a very solid article that estimated that there were indeed going to be 600,000 self-published items in 2015. And that's a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm not even sure how you count it or where you would count it because lots of self-published authors don't do things like register for copyright the way that established authors do and they, they kind of distribute it here and there. So I'm not even exactly sure how you would get a reliable figure. Why has self-publishing become more important? The main thing has been ebooks. Um, as you may or may not know, Amazon after, had more ebooks sold starting in November 2011 than print books. And everywhere within the library community, within the publishing community, we're looking at the changes that ebooks are causing. And so that the ebook has made it possible to have the self publishing because you get a digital file and then you can share it in, as I'll describe in a minute or two. I don't quite want to forget print on demand. I don't think that this is important as digital, but there are machines called the espresso machines that in about 20 minutes they can take a digital file and turn it into a book that looks almost as good as the books that you would get from a commercial publisher, especially since commercially published books have become a little bit shoddy. Um, I had a student a few years ago bring a copy in of an 1854 book on veterinary medicine, and I actually think it probably looked better that way than it did when it initially came out. Uh, as a quick aside, I, I have a student who works at, uh, at the University of Michigan, and she mentioned to my online class that the machine isn't getting as much use as they expected, and I think that that would be another thing to look into. Why, why isn't this more important? The second thing is, and this is my main point about the internet and why it's changing things, 
the internet really has become an efficient marketplace. Before the internet, it was very difficult for somebody that had something to sell and somebody that would be interested in that to come together. And I said, I talked about the out of print book market. Uh, the out of print books used to cost about $25 as a minimum because of the cost of just getting buyer and seller together. The same was true for self-publishing. How did you do self-publishing in the past? Uh, you went to a vanity press. They printed out so many copies. They delivered them to you. You put them in your garage. You didn't know what to do with them. And eventually, they either went to be recycled or you gave them to libraries for a tax benefit. And only in a very few cases did you make any money because it was very hard to get any kind of publicity even if somebody out there perhaps did indeed want to buy your self-published book. The other thing is the principle of the long tail. The long tail has become much more important on the internet. What the long tail says, that yes indeed, that the 20% of the things at the top generate 80% of your sales. But the long tail collectively can be very important. And so that for Amazon, to bring in self-published materials is not all that difficult. And while none of the individual items may sell all that much, though there are exceptions, collectively that will bring in a lot of revenue. And so that they're no longer looking at a restricted marketplace, only the books you can put in a bookstore, only the books you can put in a library. You're looking at a much wider basket of materials. I'm quite sure that the number of titles on Amazon is probably between 12 and 15 million. And they're all there, they're all searchable. And so the ones at the bottom certainly aren't selling many copies, but collectively Amazon is getting revenue that it wouldn't get if they weren't there. Um, another reason is from the author side. Uh, authors get tired of rejection letters. And so you send it out, it comes back. You send it out, it comes back. And publishing has been so consolidated and so profit-oriented that it's looking for the commercial publishers, are looking for blockbusters. And if you're a brand new author coming with your new book, your odds of getting it published are much less than they would have been 20 or 30 years ago. So that the authors look towards self-publishing as a way to make their products available without having to go through the commercial publisher that very often won't want what they have to, to, to sell or what the publisher would take. And we have the powerful companies like Amazon. I, I taught my collection development class yesterday and I described Amazon as the gorilla. It's the gorilla in publishing right now. And so what the internet has also done is it's tended to eliminate middlemen. And so, again, uh, well, uh, simplifying a bit, in the traditional model, the author got one third, the publisher got one third, and the seller got one third. And what Amazon would like to do is eliminate the middlemen. And so you won't have the publisher because Amazon will take your self-published item and they will sell it. And so the author gets a bit more, and Amazon's got it figured out that they'll get a lot more. So the third that gets sliced up, we can guess which of the two people is going to get more of the slice that the publisher is no longer getting. And so they're looking at this as a very good way for them to become profitable, and at least unofficially, Amazon really has the goal of getting some very popular bestseller author finally to offer it only on Amazon and they can see what will happen because the author will then get even more money than they would get from a publisher. Um, the other thing about it is that self-publishing eliminates many of the traditional risks of publishing. Uh, publishers are having trouble staying in business. There's the cost of editors, there's the cost of acquisitions, contracts, all of the things that will show up a bit in the disadvantage. While if you're self-publishing, you're sending a digital file to Amazon, and all Amazon has to do is add a little bit of extra space to these 
mammoth server farms that they have all over the place. It's digital, it sits there, it doesn't cost that much. If somebody buys it, wow, the author gets something, Amazon gets something, and so there's very little to lose for Amazon and the other people in self-publishing to get their materials. And to talk about who else is out there, there is a secondary industry of support services for self-publishing that has arisen. Uh, they both provide support services and make and sell the books. And so one of the ones that is the most popular is called Smashwords. And so uh, they, they, will, they say to you as author, we'll, we'll help you do it and then we'll sell it. And if it makes any money, well, we'll take some of it and you'll take some of it. And so that's basically the reasons why it is. It's a way to get lots more stuff into print that would have not been able to get into print through the physical world with commercial publishers. Uh, okay, uh, general advantages. You can publish at minimal cost. So it doesn't take too much. Uh, we could all go out this afternoon, write a short story, uh, find the correct page on Amazon, uh, figure out what we needed to do to format it correctly, get it uploaded, and we'd have something for sale on Amazon. I have several friends who are doing that. One of the people that wrote an article is out there writing lots and lots of short stories, and he's trying to sell them at 99 cents a piece. And so he likes writing, he's prolific, and so there's no problems. The, this is important, probably maybe even more for academic authors. The author is in complete control of the product. Uh, one of the people that wrote for me uh, had produced an academic title. And to have the commercial publisher do it, it had to be in 10-point typeface, which he made, I forget his joke about it, but they said it was like reading, uh, uh, it was like reading the, the, the agreements you sign before you log on to a website. It was in this small type. He wasn't allowed to have many photographs, and so he's now working on a new book, and one of the reasons that he wants to self-publish is that he can have all of the photographs he wants. And support is available at a cost. So you go to Smashwords or any of their competitors, and they say, okay, we'll take it, and would you like editing? Would you like us to select your cover for you? Would we, you like us to do X and Y and Z? And so the costs will go up, but the support services is there for the budding author who doesn't know how to do these things. And so that's one of the other things that can happen. Uh, the publishers do add valuable services. And I want to make a difference between what will pro be provided to you by Smashwords and what a publisher will do. What a Smashwords will do is that they'll probably put you in touch with a copy editor. So the copy editor is going to go through and correct your grammatical mistakes, uh, suggest that this isn't the wrong word, do this and that. What the publishers really do well, however, is know what you should do substantively to make major changes to your book so you can, it will get more readers. I will give you two stories. My wife works with someone who came out with a mini bestseller. And she had the publisher go through it and said, you really need to emphasize this. You're talking too much about that. It's not going to sell unless you make some major changes with it. The other story is that uh, we had an author come to give a presentation at her high school who then we put up for the night because she wasn't charging much for her visit. And her first book came out commercially. And it, while it actually sold quite well, something like 40,000 copies, she couldn't find a publisher for her second book. So she put it out as a self-published item my spouse read both books, and she said that the self-published book was decidedly inferior to the one that received the services that a publisher could provide. And so that one of the services that the publisher will do will look at it from the perspective of the marketplace 
and make it possible perhaps for it to acquire more readers. Um, the, and again, the final product doesn't need to be inferior if you self-publish, but the general sense from, again, the authors in the papers that I published said that it often is. Yes, you can come up with good cover art. Yes, you can come up with the photographs that are right. Yes, you can select the typeface. So that it doesn't mean that you're not going to have as good a book as a commercial publisher, but the odds are that you won't because you're new to it and even the support you get won't necessarily be of the same quality. So if the publisher is helping you, the publisher really wants you to succeed. If you're contracting with somebody, yeah, they would like you to succeed, but as long as they pocket their commission or fee, they're not as interested. And so that can be another thing. So the final product may not be as good. I've already said the support services cost money. So anything you add, it's going to be extra fees. Probably the biggest one is that the author is then responsible for the marketing. So that if the publisher brings your book up, the publisher may not do as much as you think the publisher should, but the publisher is going to do something. It's going to be in the, the, the weekly salesman books to push. It's going to get into the catalog. Well, if you self-publish, you're going to have to be the one that markets it. And if you go out on the internet now, you, can't, you will find lots and lots of books on how you can market your self-published books. And as I said, the piece I heard at NPR was how to do it. Um, I will say a bit more about that later. Um, this is also one of the more difficult ones. The publisher is well established in the distribution channels, both for popular trade materials and for scholarly materials. So that the publisher will take the book and will be make sure that it's distributed by the traditional vendors. So both the vendors for the library and the bookstore market will hear about your book because the publisher wants to, them to know about it. And so it easily fits in and so it is picked up. It will be unlikely to get reviews. Um, I'm going to talk, reviews are important for libraries. They're somewhat important for bookstores. So there is no, there are not, the reviews are starting to appear on self-published self books but there are an infinitesimal percentage of the books that get self-published. And even in the traditional system, lots of books never get reviewed, but your odds of getting a review are much higher. And so that there won't be reviews, and reviews are one of the ways of getting publicity. Now, there are other things like Goodreads, which are now making it possible for the people that read books to make them know uh, the people who read them on Amazon can give a review, but the traditional reviews are, are not there. I, I would be curious, I would doubt that a self-published book has ever been reviewed by the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. I could be wrong, but that's not what they are looking for. This is surprisingly important. I should have brought a book in. You know that stuff, that information that's on the back of the title page? that includes all the cataloging information. Well, that is produced by what's called the Cataloging and Publication Division at the Library of Congress. And it's important because lots of people take that information and feed it into their systems. So that the vendors get that and they identify then the books that they make known to bookstores and publish and to libraries. Um, it gets into books and print, which is also used. And so Self-published books are not eligible for cataloging and publication, and while it may appear minor to you within the scheme of the marketplace, it has quite a bit of importance because these machine-readable records get sent out, they get used, they make it easier for libraries to catalog the material, they get into all of these sources. Uh, Self-publishing for profit. Profits are possible. Uh, 
Fifty Shades of Grey began as a self-published book. And it did so well as a self-published book. The publisher came along and said, let's change the title. Let's bring it out as a regular publication. And then it hit the bestseller list. But it started as a self-published book. Uh, this used to be the same thing that they did with vanity presses. They would say, and there was this one book um, that did well as a vanity press. Does anybody happen to know what the most sold vanity press book ever in the history of publishing was? Uh, Mary Bates, what? The Celestine Prophecy? No, <laughs> it, it actually was, uh, it was the one about Christian science. That, that it was no publisher would publish Mary Baker Eddy's book on Christian science. So she self-published it, and she sent all the members of her religion to go out and sell it door to door. And it, it, she was so successful that she kept, kept self-publishing it, and whenever she needed money, she'd come out with a new edition and induce the faithful to buy the revised edition. <laughs> well, I got one question before you go on there. Is, uh, was any of uh, Isaac Eisen uh, so early books are self-published? I really don't know. A lot of, a lot of his work, but you know, I was interested in your scholar opinion. I, I, have not, I, I am not aware of that. All right, I also was at a, a conference and there was a support company there that helped produce these. It wasn't Smash Words, it was another one they dealt with. And I went and asked about how successful they were and he told me that they had several millionaires from self-publishing. Um, one of the things we talked about was they are very prolific. There are prolific people out there. I know there's in the print world. Who is it? it Patrick? Well, who's the popular author? I don't know bestseller. There's one best-selling author that seems to come out with 10 or 12 books a year. Patterson. What? Patterson. Patterson. Okay. And I remember the French one, since I have a French background, called Simonon. He once wrote a novel in 24 hours. Uh, I think I read that novel. It was filled with plot holes because doing it in 24 hours isn't the best way. But, but they're very prolific. And I'll get to a reason in a few minutes on also why they sell more. All right, that's it. They can control the pricing. So that one of the strategies is that you self-publish on Amazon and you charge only 99 cents. And so collectively, especially if you write all this stuff, there will be lots and lots of people who are willing to pay 99 cents for an e-book when they're not willing to pay 9.99. Uh, this is also one of the possibilities in genre fiction. I'm going to pick on romances because I have been told that the readers of romances are insatiable that it is not uncommon for the readers to read sometimes two and three books a day. And so we have the people that are churning out the formulaic romances, selling them for 99 cents, and they're getting enough fans to buy them that they're making a good profit. And once again, if you self-publish, you don't have to deal with publishers. There's no hassle. I finished the book this morning at 8 o'clock. I know how to do this well, and it's up in a few days. I don't have to wait for months. I don't have to fight with editors. Um, maybe it isn't the best quality product, but somebody might buy it, and enough people buy, buy it, I make money. All right, until you get known, it depends upon the aggressive marketing. Um, so that they got all of these strategies about things that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to post on blogs. You're supposed to do, do this. You're supposed to do that. Uh, I'll say it here, even though see, it's the academic marketplace. I keep getting these emails in my inbox. They don't know how they got my, my email address. But you know, I have just self-published this wonderful book that I'm sure you'd love. And here it is, and it's only blankety blank dollars. Um, one of the biggest names in the field actually did that. And it was. Uh, I, here's my book, it's only $9.99, why don't you just buy it? And so, uh, that you need to market. <clears throat> I would expect that sales do not normally meet expectations. Uh, one of the other people that wrote for me was one of the best known names in the library field. For those of you, it was Walt Crawford, that's a familiar name to you. He's very prolific, he's retired, and he wrote a book 
that he expected would sell a minimum of 600 copies. It sold 60. And so this was to libraries. So he was made this for libraries. He, he is a household name in library publishing. But in part because it was self-published, it was more difficult for libraries to acquire. And I'll get to that in a bit. But he didn't meet his self-expectations. He made it very clear in his piece just how disappointed he was that it was that low sales figures. All right, for academics, I'm going to go and talk a bit more about the fact that if you self-publish, you can do everything you want. And I'm also going to talk about Dr. Neville. He's not self-publishing, but it's the same advantage. Uh, his, his wonderful work on the Modern Library series, which he has talked about here in this room, is finally going to appear, and it's appearing because it's digital. So he can include all of the detail that would have made it almost an impossible physical book. Um, and that's not the same as self-publishing, but the same principle applies. You can add your data sets. You can put photographs. You can have extensive documentation. Um, thanks to Dr. Angelescu, I reviewed a book on uh, intellectual freedom in France in the, in the 18th century, and in addition to the book, uh, somewhere the author said, and there are 180 additional pages of documentation on the web, click here. If you're self-publishing, you don't have to have them click here, you can contain it. So you produce the product that makes you happy, and sometimes as an academic, you want to make sure your message is clear the way you want it to be, and you don't want an editor to mess with what you think is important. I still remember having edited items. Uh, the author and I agreed upon the text. It went in to the publishers. The publishers hacked and slashed at it. And then I'm the one that got the angry email saying, this isn't what I said. I, I still remember with great anger when I used the word de jure correctly and the publisher changed it to de facto and made it incorrect. And so I looked like an idiot, and I wasn't the idiot. So this gives you complete control. How you want to present the book is how it will appear. If you do it right and you format it correctly, if you have those skills. Um, OK, I just said some academic publications are not suitable for print publication. This will allow things that, for whatever reason, did not fit in the traditional scholarly print or traditional ebook stream to be able to be published. Um, if you want, you can distribute it at no cost. If you're an academic, you're going to have to decide, do you want to make a bit of money or do you want to increase your scholarly reputation? And there are some choices between the two of them. So you could just distribute it for free. Um, Amazon has no problems if you want to distribute free, or there's plenty of places where you could just make the book free, uh, put it in the institutional repository, uh, certainly should help your citation come. And, but there is a potential for profit. Unlike publishers where, all right, I, I edited a book. And in between the last one I had edited and the one that I was editing now, they had changed the rules. And so suddenly, after having worked on this for months, I got the horrified notice that I wasn't going to get a cent unless it sold 500 copies. Do you know how many library science books sell over 500 copies? I had spent hours and weeks on this, and I finally said, I'm quitting unless you send me a check for $500, which they did. And it's not going to sell 500 copies. But in the self-publishing market, if you sell one copy, you get something. And if you sell 10, you get, so it, it's not the same way that there's a floor before you start to make any money. And with commercial publication in print or as e-books or both, there is normally a floor from the publisher because the publisher wants to recoup some of the overhead costs or just wants to screw the author. All right. and as we all know, um, it's getting harder to publish academic monographs through the traditional channels because 
the university presses are being told that they need to cover a bit more of their costs. They need to have things that sell. The library market has diminished. Um, lots of print runs for university press titles are now 300, even for popular subjects. And so if you're dealing with research in an area that's not popular and won't sell and there's relatively few readers, you may never get your work published unless you go the self-publishing route because no publisher is going to want to deal with a book that is going to sell so few copies. Um, this, I think, is the big disadvantage. Uh, I doubt that at the current time there is going to be much reward in the current tenure and promotion system for self-publishing. Let me say that for the future of scholarly communication, I certainly hope that this will change. I think the only way humanity scholars are going to survive if they have to produce a tenure book is to find some way to get outside bodies to say, yes, this was self-published, but we looked at it and we have given it the seal of approval. There was nothing wrong with the research. The only problem was that this is not a topic that will make it in today's marketplace. And I keep hoping this would happen because I feel sorry, very sorry for lots of humanity scholars who are having increasingly difficult times in getting their very good scholarship accepted, not because it's bad scholarship, but because there's not many people out there that are going to want to buy it. Again, I just mentioned the the conflict between open access and profit. Um, uh, I don't care, I've got all of my stuff in our institutional repository, but there's some people that it would probably be nice even to have an extra $500 a year. Um, if I were an adjunct professor making what adjunct professors make, that might be a lot of money in my budget. If I was trying to get a permanent position in publishing, to get a permanent position, and I did it this way, and I at least got a small amount of money Okay, open access, more scholarly impact and citations. Um, I don't know how they are going, but I don't, I don't exactly understand why, but I've had about 5% of the citations I've ever had in the last month. Uh, just suddenly my citation, and I don't know why, but it could be the fact that things are available on the institutional repository for free. Um, profit is a direct reward. I think all of us like money, even if it isn't all that much. It has a symbolic value, even if it doesn't really have, um, I, I think at times we've all talked about we could take our raises and we could buy lunch. <laughs> um, I'm now going to change a little bit of the focus and talk about faculty and libraries as consumers of self-published books. I actually think that there are some self-published books that have potential value as source materials. Um, I, I've kind of said this and they said, well, what about the quality? And yes, I don't think that I'm going to buy a self-published book on genetic research. I don't think I'm going to buy one on crime in America. But if I were a Vietnamese veteran that was publishing my memoirs, that has value as a source document for future scholarship. And in a sense, you don't care about the quality. You're caring that somebody is writing about their personal experiences. So is that difference clear to those of you out there? That it really is different. And so that I might want that for my research because it gives me another perspective. It gives me a perspective from a participant. The participant may be lying, but at least it's another piece of evidence and something I might want. The other one I thought was about local history resources. So that if I'm writing the history of Lapeer, Michigan, and we've got these authors that have self-published about Aunt Matilda growing up in Lapeer, this again has some potential use as a source document. You're not worried about the quality of it, you're worried about the value that it has for your research. 
I want to talk a bit about libraries. Your libraries do not know how to deal with self-published materials. <laughs> um, uh, one of the advantages of teaching online is that the students have to post their answers and lots of them may not be librarians, but they work in libraries. And when I give them the question of the week, they'll go back and they ask their library what they do. And the general sense is, we just don't know what to do with these. Um, what do we do if a patron wants it? What, are we, what do we do if it's about our area? And I have more to, a bit more to say about that for public libraries. Um, and what happens if there's a reader request for it? And I, I told you, I'm waiting for Amazon to get a best-selling author to publish only with them, without a commercial imprint, and see what happens. What will libraries do if there's suddenly something that would be on the New York Times bestseller list if it had been published traditionally and has generated great demand? If that's happened, I don't know about it, but I'm very interested to see what will happen. And I know Amazon is trying to get that case. Um, funding issues. We, libraries don't have enough money for the traditional stuff anymore. Uh, I know how little money I have to support the Romance languages, which is the area I buy for. Even libraries with a fair amount of money, unless you get to the biggies, and I'm going to get to the biggies in a minute, are having enough trouble dealing with the flood of traditional materials that adding another layer of non-traditional materials could very well be difficult. Um, how do you find out about them? How do you identify them? This is the other side of getting into the traditional marketing channels because libraries find out about those things from the traditional channels and these are not in the traditional channels. So, so what do you do even if you're interested in the stuff to be able to find it? Okay, again, I anticipated less likely to be in the standard channels. And um, this may not be as true for academic libraries, but lots of public libraries really have a rule that you can't buy it unless it has a favorable review or two favorable reviews. This is something my students tell me all the time. There's got to be reviews. And this stuff isn't getting reviewed. So by that, you, they would have to go get an exception to get it, and they're not sure it's worth it, and so it makes it less likely for the popular materials to make it into the public library where there might be readers. Um, I think that there is still a stigma to self-publication. Uh, again, I kind of chat about this to people I know, and they still say, oh, vanity books. They still think of the old vanity presses with the garage full of worthless stuff, not realizing that there could be reasons why this is better and perhaps more important. And, but there is the issue of quality control. I was looking for materials for this presentation, and somebody said, this is all and well and good, but I, your last book was filled with typos. And that even if the content is good, having typos is not good for getting confidence in the material you're reading. And so there, and I, I'll go back once again from the library point of view, the things that made it more likely to be sold in the bookstore may also be the things that will make it more likely to appeal to the readers in the library. I, I know that I, I'm just going to bring up real two quick issues with public libraries. Um, I subscribe, I, I teach, teach students from all types of libraries, so I'm actually subscribed to the public library's discussion list. And I also find jobs for our students that I pass on to our jobs list. And one of the things that keeps coming up, that local authors are now starting to pressure their local public library not only to buy the book, but to sponsor a book signing for them. And I suspect that this must be in some of those hints on how to market your book. And they say, go find your public library. And that can be one of the ways you can make your book now. And the libraries are hesitant. Um, while it is not true that libraries debt everything they have, smaller libraries of all types, academic, public, and school, 
normally have measures of quality control, and there is a sense in the smaller public library, why should we do this book if it's not going to be good? But on the other hand, if it were in print from a local author, we get it. So they're getting a great tension between two principles. All right, my conclusion. Um, there's major shifts in publication and perhaps in scholarly communication. And what concerns me a bit is that there really isn't a whole lot of talk about it yet. I think that the issues I've raised today, to which I don't have good solutions at this point, are important enough that libraries that need to consider. Okay, I need to go back. I'm sorry. I need to go back. I'm, I should have said one. Okay, I'm going to go back to academic libraries and research, and I'm going to talk for a minute, and I, I should have had a separate point, about the Harvards, the Yales, and the Princetons, and the Berkeleys, and maybe the Michigans, where the goal of some of those libraries in certain subjects is to collect comprehensively. So they want to get everything available on this topic. And one of my frustrations with my special issue is I don't know if those libraries are including self-published books. So that if, for example, Yale University collects everything on Bingham, who was the discoverer, discoverer of Machu Picchu. I have no idea, and on Lindbergh, I have the Lindbergh collection. So are these libraries at the top of the chain with lots of money and lots of support going out and looking for self-published materials or not? Um, I'm going to a conference in about a month and I'm hoping to find some people that will perhaps give me answers to that, but that's one of my unexamined questions as far as how that piece is going to fit in. So that the person coming to use the Lindbergh collection is going to find the last off-the-wall theory on who killed his kid. And while it may be off the wall, if you're comprehensively interested in that topic, it's something that you probably want to get your hands on. And so, as I said, I, I'm mostly bringing up questions. I think if we're going to get an area with 600,000 publications, we've got to come to some sense both as academics, for those of you that might be interested to us, and for collecting of knowledge for the libraries. And I don't know if the people in the English department are going to become interested in some of the authors that do self-publishing. Um, and so what we have is a vast increase in the number of publications without quality control. Um, I'm going to make one other point that I think is important for, especially for those of us that have been around for a bit. Do you realize that in the 1980s, libraries actually believed that they could control all knowledge? There were groups in the International Federation of Library Associations that really talked about universal bibliographic control, universal availability of publications. They knew that it really wasn't possible, but it was close enough that it was worth trying. And so that one of the major shifts in knowledge with the arrival of the internet, that once all of this stuff started appearing on the internet, and we got all of this data from sensors, we got all of the weather things, that we have no longer have this sense that we can manage it all and in some ways, this has been good. So that there has been more of a focus, at least in the library world, than we should get what our patrons need trying to collect it all. But at least in some areas, there's still some libraries out there that want to collect it all. And I'm not sure that the, how they're dealing with, um, with, with self-published work. And there's the issues of tenure promotion and merit increases. I would not tell any of the faculty that I serve as a mentor to who are looking for tenure that they should self-publish. I should say send it out three or four times before you consider self-publication. Do what you need to do. Try to get it into a format that will count because it's vetted. Uh, I have even noticed 
that there is still a bias of liking it better if it's in print at some point. That the e-publications only are still regarded with suspect, uh, suspicion. So that if if you were if it were really good, somebody somewhere would publish it in print. And so I think that's the big issue for those of us around the table who need to publish and who are academics. Um, I'm beyond having to worry about these things, but I certainly would not self-publish any of my materials if I could find any other way to do it. Okay, it's your turn. Yeah, I got a question right here. Um, since self-publishing, uh, since the way you uh, uh, talk about self-publishing, uh, self-publishing existed uh, now way before. Yeah, it did. I, I know uh, that. So which means then the self-publishing is really a traditional term, not a postmodern term. So my question though would be, since you are a scholar, uh, what's the relationship between this lecture and the notion among some in the self-publishing uh, area, what I would prefer to call personal publication rather than uh, uh, self-publishing? What, how is that related to, for instance, that uh, the view of some that uh, peer-based uh, scholarly publication is on the downturn? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, it, 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 all right. I, I think major change. Okay. We, we all talk about the scholarly communication crisis, and I am of the opinion that the quickest way to resolve it would be to change the rules of the people that sit around this table on the fourth floor once a year at Wayne. And change it around all of those tables. And if suddenly we made more things acceptable and found some way to judge them, then that would be a great help. This came up in my academic libraries class. I sat around the round table, one, or the oval table one year. And part of the issue is, I'm in library science, I have a background in French, I understand the quality often of the things that come in my area and many of the humanities areas. If I get the publications from engineering, I look at them and I don't even know what the title means. So it is impossible for me to be able to judge their quality. And so that most tenure and promotion committees then use as a surrogate, this publication has to be good because Oxford University Press published it. This publication isn't quite as good because it was published by uh, Kokomo University Press and that's not as respectable. And so it is an easier way to be able to judge scholarly output even when you can't judge the content. And I will return to what I said, is I wish that we could get some sort of peer review for e-books, self-published books, that would be rigorous enough that it would be respected so that these poor humanity scholars who can't find a publisher would get materials that the scholars, at least some scholars would want, and at the same time, they would get credit for keeping their jobs. But for the moment, peer review is still in the So why didn't you self-publish? I get my stuff published in the right places most of the time. I got one out there that I got to rework, but most of the time people will pick my stuff. I, yeah, well, I have a question right now. It just seems like there's a flood of books anyway. I mean, like, I was just, I just had showed them my uh, iPad, and I, I, I didn't buy any of the books I got. I got like 300 books on my iPad, none of which I paid for. And it got me to thinking that if that kind of, like, these are like called the, you know, the, the classic books or all this right. stuff. But still, there are occasional little self-publishers there too. And I thought to myself, how is any, how is this a flood of information and flood of books to be able to get books without having to pay for them? What is that doing to the publishing industry? Okay, industry there are itself? a lot. Of, okay, I, I know people who have a Kindle and all they read are the free books. My spouse has tried the free book. She reads a lot more novels than I do, and she says most of them are trash. But this person is real happy with the free books. And what I'm saying is we already had a flood of traditional 250,000 titles 
a year is a lot. And now we're going to add even more and triple that with the 600,000 self-published. And that is part of the problem. Again, as for this presentation, I went on Smashwords. And I kind of went through the books. And I didn't have the faintest idea how I would have chosen the ones that I might have wanted to read. I, I really didn't know. So you're, you're posing an excellent question. But more and more people are going into self-publishing. A lot of them, it may indeed be that they just want to know, they just want to have Aunt Matilda's growing up memoir available, and they don't care, but they can go to a party and say, look, at here's my book. In vanity publishing in print, that was the reason in lots of cases. Here it is, here's my book. So, but I don't have an answer to that. That's part of the problem. That's why things may need to change. Or So, it seems to me, to address specifically the, the academic books, that the, the problem is actually not a technical problem at all. There's really no technical no. reason why you couldn't have peer review on self-published books. After all, we don't get paid for the peer review we do. No, there is uh, no technical but, and, and there really is very minimal cost. Yeah. Uh, the only thing the press does is find a peer reviewer, and goodness knows they don't always find the most appropriate peer reviewers for your work. Agreed. And, and so it, it really seems that the, the difficulty is that we haven't been creative enough in thinking about what would it look like for a community of scholars right. to set up a system of peer review for self-published material or for just, in, you wouldn't call it self-published at this point, it's really about publishing e-books right. that don't, have, that don't a have a publisher's name, name right. on. I, I'm thoroughly in agreement. And there's the concerns about peer review now. The people that say, oh yeah, you talk about peer review, but it's really phony. That, 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 that what they just did is that they, they sent out, a, 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 what happened last week just came yeah. out. They, they sent out an, a, a bogus article and a very high percentage of the people that looked at it thought it was great and said we'd publish it and it was made up and obviously made up. So there's the concerns about peer review. What would probably need to happen would be a professional association takes over this process and indeed makes it rigorous. That it is known that yes, I submitted my book and it was junk or it wasn't good scholarship, not junk, it wasn't good scholarship and so it wasn't accepted, it was sent back for revisions, it went through a couple of processes. But I agree with you, there is no technical reason why it can't happen. It would be wonderful for libraries and readers to have all of this stuff available at a minimal cost. And there would be scholars in certain fields who, that are quite small who would be very happy to get those materials. Has there been efforts that you know of to establish kind of a review community? Like, uh, it well? gets talked about. I, I don't know of any real efforts to do it. it. I go to the Charleston Conference, which is the premier conference for scholarly communication. It brings together publishers, librarians, vendors, and so it's very good because it's not just librarians talking to librarians. And this idea surfaces every year or two, but it doesn't seem to get very far, and I don't know what would be needed to have it get further. But it, I think it makes sense. Paul? Um, I think there was a question earlier about Isaac Asimov. Right. And I think that that's one of the things you need to take into consideration when you're talking about building library collections. Because Asimov published in the pulps, which were probably things that had every bit as much prestige as self-publishing at the time he was publishing. And yet, um, if, you, if I had a collection of those pulps today, I'd have quite a successful special collection of the library. Agreed. And I think Bowling Green became very well known for having such a collection. Uh, this is getting to be a major venue, I know, for science fiction. Uh, one of the people who has made the jump from being uh, published in Kindle over to being published in print is the guy who wrote War, which is going to end up being a motion picture and is now a trilogy, which is like the standard work for science fiction, I guess. So at some point, when we have to get over certain kinds of technological problems to build them into the collection, because right now, even if the Board of Governors hadn't forbidden the university to buy Kindle books, 
I couldn't serve Kindle books out to the general public. I just don't have a technological way of doing it. But that's a, if I was trying to build up a popular culture collection, I would be buying the Kindle books, looking forward to the time at which I could serve them out, because that's exactly what I would okay. And I wasn't considering popular culture collections. Popular culture collections have a great need. One of my other research projects a long time ago was according to our bibliographic database, one of the publications at the supermarket checkout line read by four million Americans each week was not held by any library in the United States. And anything that's read by four million people needs to be collected by a library somewhere. The other thought that came to mind as you came up with that was maybe as somebody starts to become into radar, the need to go back and see if they have any self-published materials. And the one thing that I got a lot of, I coordinate collection development with the library, which I'll explain that to people. The one Kindle publication I got a lot of pressure on was something I would have bought in that format if I could have figured out how to push it out to the people's library. Uh, it was a guide to like, um, medical residents and somehow surviving residency or something like that. It was extremely popular, but I didn't have I could have bought a copy for $4.95 from Kindle, but once I got the copy, there was nothing I could do with it other than have it on my own desktop. And I had to wait for it to get popular enough to be published in the paperback, at which point it entered the medical <coughs> library collection. So there are those kinds of crazy things going on. And, and libraries are struggling with making books available. I have an assignment waiting to be graded on this whole question. Yes? I'm kind of curious, because I've noticed that libraries all over the place are selling books ridiculously cheap. Right. And I don't know if this is part of a way of disseminating books and getting rid of the old ones, because everything's becoming electronic now. Or is it a way of just disseminating more popular or less known works very cheaply and out in their community, or is it because they're now physical books and they're old? Uh, okay, let, let, let me put my other hat on because I'm, I'm an expert in that area too. What they're doing is they're dealing with their unwanted gifts. So the gifts come in and then they often, especially in the public library, have a volunteer group and I participate at my local public library. And they don't want them for the collection and they use it to make a bit of money. And so every month, my library holds a sale. And they're not trying to disseminate. They're trying to make some extra money for the library. Um, the out-of-print book market, as a quick update, is falling apart because of e-books. Prices are coming down. Uh, people aren't coming to buy at the sales because they don't want print anymore. And I think at some point, the libraries are going to have much less of an intake of these materials. So I think. That is one of the other areas in which the whole shift to E is going to have a great effect. But that's why they do it. Uh, some, places, some places make as much as $50,000 a year on selling the gifts. Sometimes they get really rare stuff that's worth a lot of money. It is not unheard of in a box of books that look like junk to get a couple that are worth a couple hundred dollars. And sometimes you'll even get one or two that's in a year that's worth a thousand or two thousand. People sometimes give away valuable stuff and they don't know they're doing it. Well, over, over the years, it seems like I did some reading in this area, too. Over the years, it seems like Michigan State, and uh, Michigan has probably been the biggest complainer of the prices of books. And therefore, that they were, I take it, a few years ago, that meant that they were moving towards digital uh, uh, types of things and disposing of books. But I was uh, reading in the library across state three or four years ago in computer area and came out of the library and shocked on Friday night. A whole dumpster of computer books. They all just throwing them away. C computer books when they're three years old aren't worth anything anymore. <laughs> You're correct. Uh, do we still have a service that keeps the up-to-date collection in computer books? Yes. And as new ones come out, old ones leave. Occasionally someone wants the old one and it, you have to scramble to get them for them. But th yes, there's books that become useless. Um, uh, the, the, the belief that every book is sacred is some one that people should get rid of. And if you want to know that not all books are sacred, come to the end of a book sale when you can't give the stuff away for free and look at the garbage that's there. 
Well, you can help Mr. Scholar in that. When you start, you get a chance to talk with high school kids in that, in that, who have lots of books. Tell them it's all right to write in the book. If they, uh, own, them in, if the they own them, it's all right to write in the books. Uh, one of my, my favorite graduate faculty members was so used to underlining that he couldn't read the newspaper without underlining the main topics as he worked his way through the newspaper. This gentleman was wonderful. He lived to well over a hundred. Hmm. Underline. Anything else? We're, we're, we're past the witching hour, so why don't we just...